Hi everyone. We are just starting. Uh, and good evening to our guests in the room uh, and good afternoon and good morning to everyone who are watching us on YouTube uh, and also who are in the webinar room. Um, and my name is Gülay Kılıç Aslan. Uh, I am the member of uh, the Center for Solidarity and Cooperation with Universities of North and East Syria. On behalf of the center, uh, I am pleased to welcome you all uh, to our conference's uh, keynote lecture. Today, we are honored to host Professor uh, Hamid Bozarslan as our keynote uh, presenter uh, in the center's inaugural conference. Uh, just briefly for those who are joining us from YouTube, I would like to say a couple words about the center. The center was founded in Paris uh, in November, 2021 and it aims to facilitate solidarity activities with the universities of North and East Syria through joint projects and academic relations across Europe and North America. You can find further information um, about our center's work and about how to involve in the center's activities, as well as information about the universities in North and Syria on our website. For those who are watching us on YouTube, uh, our website is on cscunes.com. Uh, before leaving the floor to Professor Hamid Bozarslan, our key keynote lecturer, let me briefly introduce him. Hamid Bozarslan holds two PhDs, one in history and the other in political sciences. He teaches at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He has published extensively on the Kurdish issue, Turkey and the Middle East. His current research is focused on the formation of the modern anti-democratic systems in Iran, Russia and Turkey, as well as the state of violence in the Middle East. His last book titled The Time of Monsters, Arab World 2011-2022 will be published in French soon. Uh, and his uh, today's lecture, title is Academia and Agora, Reflections on Freedom of Research and Democracy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hamid Bozarslan. Thank you so much for this kind of presentation. Especially Kurdi du Tazim du Se Galgal Bejim, Jibu Dostan U Hevalin Zanige Rojavai, and Mami Buerane U Hebuna Vajibu Megalek Mihime, Karan Hevidarim Keneste Kino, Neste Kino Academician, the Karbe Rojava Begishtandan, U Karbe Bebe Percheke Academia Nabnetevi, Czechic Gishti. So after this course in Kurdish, uh, I will uh, introduce my uh, my speech uh, uh, by saying that basically I will take uh, 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 I will repeat what I have uh, uh, already said in Turkish uh, for a conference for Hranding Foundation. Hranding was uh, this <clears throat> Hranding was this intellect uh, Armenian intellectual, a very humanist uh, humanistic uh, Armenian intellectual, which who had been killed fifteen years ago. Uh, and to say also thanks to the Boadic University, which is in resistance, because uh, I was asked by the colleagues of the Boadic University uh, to hold uh, this, uh, this, uh, this conference for the Hranding Foundation. And the topic they asked me to intervene on was the relationship between the academic freedoms and democracy. Or put differently, uh, to uh, comment, uh, to give some comments on academia, as a free institution and Agora as a space of expression and reproduction of uh, political freedom. So before dealing this, with this issue, we can ask ourselves the following question. In a context in which others, workers, women, human rights activists, and broadly speaking, intellectuals are repressed, rep repressed why should we defend speci specifically the academia? Why should the academia dispose a distinction, a privilege. I will come back to this issue 
uh, in a short while, uh, short while. But I would like to precise from the beginning that, of course, those who are who are members of the academia are not necessarily immune from opportunism, and that many of them have capitulated before the despotic powers. Even worse, in the Nazi Germany, one could witness to the formation of a dark elite formed thanks to the opportunities offered by the expulsion, expulsion of the Jewish academics and dissident academics. Many academics, and not only Karl Schmidt and Martin Heidegger, adhered to Nazism, and to quote Thomas Mann, advocated the necessity of a self-conscient neo-barbarianism. To answer to this question, uh, the answer to these questions resides in the fact that there is an inst interesting link between academic freedoms and political freedoms. The academic freedoms do not only constitute the mirror of the democratic freedoms, but also their precondition. This link is not an organic link, but a link that allow both, uh, allows both, uh, to both of them to come into existence. The academia and broadly speaking sciences do not have a direct, direct political mission. On the contrary, they exert a critical function that includes criticism of the political space. But there is a direct link between this function and the existence of a political space. A political space, particularly when it's a democratic one, can be defined before everything else as a regime of the renouncement to any kind of superiorities. When we look from this perspective, the most important date of the French Revolution is not the Bastille Day, when this fa infamous prison fall, but the night of the August 4th, when the French aristocracy renounced, at least theoretically, to its privileges and superiority. Democracy cannot accept the superiority of the belief to the unbelief, the superiority of one religion to another, of one confession to another, to one of one nation to another, to one of one gender to another, or of one sexual orientation to another one. Second, democracy can be defined as a system of consensus and dissensus. The first one, the consensus, allows to a territorialized community to exist as a historical formation with its historical and special landmarks, its institutions, rituals, and procedures. But this consensus can be a democratic consensus only and if only it accepts also the principle that the society is a conflicted society, a fragmented society, that the social, political, ethnic, religious conflicts are not suppressed, but recognized, negotiated, and institutionalized. This means that the institution of this census is a pre primary condition of the democratic existence. The societies that cannot develop a consensus, consensus cannot perpetuate their existence as societies. But similarly, the societies that cannot or will not legitimize the dissensus cannot preserve themselves from tyranny, authoritarianism, and totalitarianism. The politics cannot be at any, any condition the art of dancing on the heads of the snakes, as Ali Abdullah Saleh, former Yemeni president, uh, used to say. Politics is accepting the conflict, uh, the conflictual the conflicts without transforming it in a snake in a, in, into a source of nuisance. The politics is about creating collective dynamics through internal conflicts. Academia in its large diversity can be defined as the place where one renounces to any form of superiority and where consensus and dissensus do coexist. Academia needs a territorial basis and yet Sciences, and particularly the social sciences, cannot be national, nationalized, or national, na nationalist. We can illustrate from this fact by the confession of many anti-democratic leaders, among them Ahmadinejad, Khamenei, Putin, or Erdogan, that explain that they obtained great victories in every life, field of the life, but that they have failed to create a national culture or national sciences. One can observe such confessions also elsewhere, like in China or in Malaysia. 
this failure is in no way a surprise. The existence of a culture requires melancholia, tearing, self-interrogation, uncertainty. And the existence of science requires interrogation, doubt, reflexivity. The science exists because it is transmitted, but also because it is constantly questioned and criticized. What allows science to exist is not the absolute certainties, but not the undeniable facts, but fractures, dead angles, conflicted inter interpretations. That's why epistemologists such Mad, Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerabend, or Karl, Karl Popper have all promoted an epistemology based on internal pluralities and internal contradictions. Such an epistemology is not only necessary for the social sciences, but for the democratic society itself. A democratic society cannot be, uh, can be, cannot afford to be a non-epistemological society. Democracy is also epistemology. Similarly, academia can find itself in a situation where it has to fight for its existence. And this struggle might, um, might also be the struggle of knowledge, the struggle for truth, the struggle for the right to express the truth. For instance, in our world of 2020s, the culture of secret and lying that determines, determines the Chinese regime has provoked a worldwide pandemic that caused tremendous sufferings. And the academia has to say that that was the true and the secret and the lying have provoked such a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Academia might be obliged to enter into battle, but as the democracy, which is not a regime of a war, academia itself cannot be a space of or an organ of war. As the academy, as the democracy itself, academia can only deliver a war that has been imposed upon it, and a war that constitutes constitutes the condition of its survival. This war is a war of protection of its critical function in the society. The destruction of the critical function of the academia produces incurable, irreversible consequences for the entire society. For instance, it leads to the criminalization of the society or some segments of them. To give just one example, in the Soviet, former Soviet Union, in some Latin American countries, or in Turkey, the psychoanalysis was widely forbidden, but psychotherapy, psychotherapy was used in order to submit dissidences or even destroy ethnic identities. Oppositions, oppositions were considered as irresponsible passion, passions requiring psychiatric, psychiatric treatment in total isolation. And brains, brainstorming was used as means of re-education. Another example is linked to the issue of violence. Refusing to understand that violence has to be before everything else, sociologically analyzed and explained, leads not only to the criminalization of violence, but also it's analyzes exclusively as a security issue as uh, linked to the terrorism. Why the academia should be autonomous? I think that in order to answer to this question, we have to go back to the genealogy of the academia. One should admit, for instance, that at the basis of social sciences, one finds before everything else, conservatism. At the basis of sociology, both the Durkheim sociology and the Weberian so sociology, for instance, the cast of coercion in European societies was the key word. The sociologists were afraid of the consequences of the French Revolution and the in Industrial Revolution. And the questions that the first sociologists asked themselves was the following ones. What is a society and how a society can be possible? How could one produce social solidarity? What is power? And how has one or could one produce obedience and norms of obedience? All these questions are conservative questions, and the sociologists answered to these questions with conservative answers. <laughs> Gradually, however, sociology, 
social sciences and the so-called positive, positive sciences were able to overcome this conservatism. And this evolution took place partly because they were able or even constrained to institutionalize themselves and partly because this institutionalization required also the establishment of a scientific autonomy. The institutionalization meant that scientific, uh, scientific production took place in a dedicated space and platform, but also that it had to be publicly exposed to criticism coming both from academia and from the outside of the academia. Exposing and defending a scientific, a scientific thinking, a scientific methodology or scientific debates were also a means of transmitting them, diffusing them, criticizing them, and renewing them. And the issue of autonomization. Because in order to exist in the public space, academia had to create its own forms of evaluation, develop its own norms, its methodologies, develop a professional ethic, or deontology, which cannot be conformed, conformed by, with the religious ethic and cannot be sacralized. Academia was, uh, has to invent uh, its autonomy because it has to defend uh, its scientific honor and promote scientific courage. This autonomy means that in the most cases, academia is a part of the state structures but also, paradoxically, the state finances those who are in charge of criticizing the society, the state, and the relation of power, relations of power and domination, as much as criticizing its own structures and its internal power relations. That's thanks to this institutionalization and thanks to this autonomy that academia was able to free itself, uh, at least in some historical conditions, and in some spaces from the conservative grounds and concerns, concerns that gave birth to it and develop mechanisms of self-criticism. As I mentioned, in the case of the sociology, the initial questions were how the society could be kept together, how internal solidarity could be developed, how obedience should be, could be produced. Gradually, these questions left room to the other questions. How did the society been found? What kind of inequalities were consubstantial to the formation of the society? Who have been included? Who have been excluded? What kind of norms, naturalized or sacralized principles, rules have been dictated or are still dictated to the society? Today, without asking these questions, it could be sim simply impossible to think to the feminist issues, to colonialism, to racism, to the fate of minorized uh, ethnic and religious groups. Asking these questions is also defending ethics against particularistic, particularistic ethos that refuse any form of universal liberty, any form of democracy, equality, or emancipation. Ethos, the, what we call ethos, try to defend the presumable right of a particularistic entity or body to dominate the others. Ethics, on the contrary, do not deny the existence of pluralistic elements, entities, and corps. They take into account their subjectivities, their voices, their roots, and their sorrows, but refuse any right of any form of claim of superiority or domination. Ethics allows at the same time the overcoming of particularisms through universalistic perspectives. Ethics allows building an interpretative and yet self-critical bound between particularism and universalism. Ethics allows the criticism of universal by taking into account any single, any localized event, phenomenon in time and in space. Just allow me to give one or two examples. The tragedy of Syria, the destruction of the Syrian society brings us to understand the process of war, violence, and decivilization well beyond the Syrian borders. 
it is not only the Syrian question, Syrian society or power that we question through ethics, but also our own limitations in understanding, explaining and exploring such processes. A second case, the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda. This genocide requires, understanding this genocide requires that we take into account other genocides, but also the world history, the radicalized power relations, social Darwinism, imaginary of organic societies. All these issues are not only the issues concerning social sciences, but basically any science, any branch of science has its own say on this massive disruptive events. These two examples, war in Syria and genocide of Tutsis are of course extreme cases, but we can take other cases rather benign or insignificant cases like the coming French presidential elections. This election is taking place in a very particular country called France. But the elections allows us to rethink issues such electoral society, sociology, radical nationalism, sovereignist ideologies, process of political mobilizations and demobilizations, blockages of the democratic societies, new fault lines. Obviously, the coming presidential election in France is a national one. It is determined by national traditions, patterns, constraints, and opportunities, and at least for some actors, but the, uh, the, 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 uh, the electoral sociology, which is specifically French sociology. But at the same time, the analysis of this election, coming election, means that uh, the French sociologists have to get in touch with the non-French sociologists. They have to contradict each other's opinions. They have to engage a discussion, not only on France, but on the evolution of the democratic societies in 2020s. And this requires also an, ethic, an ethical approach. And ethics, the universal ethics, goes hand in hand with a professional deontology. There is a difference between ethics and deontology. The, the ontology is responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the requirements of the profession. The ontology is the refusal of the so-called absolute truths, the so-called national obligations that are imposed upon the, upon the profession. The ontology means the refusal of loyalty to national history or to the so-called national security imperatives. The ontology means reflexivity, and this means a reflexivity on the modes of production, diffusion, and refutation of scientific knowledge. This responsibility also means that academia has to, all, to accomplish a series of non-scientific missions. Among them, the mission of creating a collective democratic reflexivity. Among them, struggling against demagogy, and conspiracy theories. Among them, denouncing the theories such that uh, the theory of grid replacement that uh, create the basis for a massive racism in democratic societies like in France. And this ethical and deontological responsibility, extra scientific responsibility, means also today that we have to deconstruct to show the absolute factual falseness of Putin's discourse that legitimizes the invasion of Ukraine. I will come back to this issue. But the invasion of Ukraine is not the only case. The management of the COVID crisis in many countries, the mismanagement of the European democracies concerning the ecological catastrophe, the feminist, feminist the wild urbanization throughout the, the world, all these issues are the issues of citizenship and academia has its own to, uh, its word to say on these issues, not only from a, from a scientific perspective, but in order to accomplish a non-scientific or extra scientific mission. As Hannah Arendt precisely, in all these fields, academia 
is not the decision maker and should not become a decision maker. But in all these issues, it has to play, it should play a decisive role in the decision making processes. It has to bring rationality and criticism into decision making processes. It has to criticize and deconstruct the usually unquestioned categories. These categories are the following. What do we mean when we mention Russia's national security priorities? Who decide, decides that these priorities are national or these priorities are security priorities? Uh, before uh, everything else, in the Russian case, for instance, we see a violent nostalgia of empires that Putin speaks out openly. We see a bloody engineering which consists to keep alive all the conflicts in worldwide, in Caucasus, in Syria, and elsewhere. And we have, as, acad as academia, show, deconstruct the nature of these discourses and showing that they, have, they are neither natural, nor national, nor priorities. This does not mean that the academia should suppress its axiological neutrality. But it is also evident that this neut neutrality is only academic and no lens for lens, academia has to become, in many cases, a counterpower. It has to become a counterpower, not less because the totalitarian tyrannies of the 1920s and 1930s, as much as the anti-democracies of democracies of our day, our days, destruct the cognitive, cognitive faculties of the societies. These systematic destructions of the landmarks that allow a society to perceive, uh, to, 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 to have trust in time and space was one of the obsessions in the 1920s and 1930s. Hannah Arendt, for instance, has shown that totalitarianism was, before everything, a regime of perpetual movement which destroyed time and space. Victor Klemperer, underlined that in the, Nazis, in the case of Nazism, everything was historical, and that meant that history itself was destroyed. The destruction of history was also the destruction of the time. Walter Benjamin has underlined, for instance, that the cloaks of Nazism and the totalitarianism did not count the time, but destroyed the time. And today, we are in such a world an Orwellian world, an Orwellian world of perpetual enmity, perpetual war, but who is the enemy, who is the fool, and who is the friend? An Aure Aurelian world in which societies which are knocked out are proud of what they call their pure national ontology, in which the time is destroyed, but one can sacralize the brutalized space in which the economy is in ruin, agriculture, education, technological investments are collapsing, but still the societies can think that their nation has a historical mission, an imperial mission to accomplish. Academia, very much as the cultural intellectual field, broadly speaking, has to restitute the cognitive faculties of a society. This can take place in very difficult conditions. Just take the movie of Ettore Scola with wonderful Sofia Loren and wonderful Marcello Mastroianni, A Special Day, 1977. In this movie, you have a civilization collapsed. In Europe, there is no more civilization remained, at least in Italy and in Germany. And the entire Roma is out welcoming Hitler coming to a state visit. And this destroyed civilization is regenerated on a roof through the encounter of a housewife and a homosexual intellectual. They together appear to be able to redefine time, to redefine space, to reinvent meaning and trust. The space is obviously only limited to a few square meters, and the time is limited to a couple of hours. But 
this limited space became universal space and this limited time became an universal time. And as the French historian Edgar Kine used to say, error provokes absurdity and absurdity provokes horror. And academia has a responsibility to prevent horror and absurdity, even in the most difficult conditions. For instance, the academia has to remind us historical facts, to say that Russia and the Western countries were definitely not been antagonistic throughout their history, that there is no such thing such as the ontologically determined civilization, that there is not such thing called a war for survival, that there is not such thing that one calls the Lebensraum, the vital space. The academia has to remind, for instance, that France, Great Britain, and Russia were not foes, but allies during the World War I. That the World War II started not because West attacked the uh, attacked Soviet Union, but because Hitler and Stalin signed an infamous agreement allowing them to jointly occupy Poland. That Stalin had an absolute true in, trust in Hitler and refused to mobilize his armies when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union. That after the Barbarossa operation, Great Britain, United States, and Soviet Union were not fools, but were allies. Reminding simply these facts, a loss to resist against historical falsifications that determine Russian nationalist imaginary of today. Struggling against falsifications means also struggling against myths, mythos. The myth that Mussolini considered as the mirror of greatness of, of Italian nation before adding, we have to subordinate every other thing to the realize, realization of this myth. And the famous Nazi theory, the scientific Alfred Rosenberg, Rosenberg wrote a book called The Myths of the 20th Century. And for him, the racist Aryan myths has to be realized. And many other murderous myths, they, including uh, the, those one who mobilizes biologists and genetics um, have dominated the 20th century, and today they appear once again. Beyond this fight against the, for the true and against the myths and falsification, academia has to choose life against death. Academia has to defend eros. Eros is not only the god of erotism. Eros is the god of life, of a plural, conflictual, co conflictful, and yet pacified life. Eros is the god that allows to the agora to exist, and allows to the people to coexist within the agora. Eros is trust in time and in space. Eros can protect a national agora and a national academia, but not an academia at the order of the nation. The borders of agora cannot be fortified as borders of a prison, and the borders of a national academia cannot become walls of a prison, prison which, which nationalizes the scientific knowledge. Anatos, on the other hand, is the god of death, god that destroys the society, but in order to accomplish, accomplish this destruction, it has to destroy before everything else pluralities, complexity, complexities, hermeneutics that allows us to understand polysemy of facts, perceptions, words, and symbols. The struggle against Thanatos, god of death, also means that scientific knowledge is used against perversion of the science and the perversion of academia as an institution. Here too, please allow me to give some examples. Social Darwinism that defines every nation as a species in war for its survival was considered as a scientific theory. The idea of the purity of blood 
was considered as a scientific fact. Goebbels declared that the war between races has always been a war of an annihilation and presented that as a scientific, historically founded scientific truth. Another example, the idea that some nations have rights to 11th round, have right to dominate and exterminate the others, as the Serbian Academy of Science tried to convince them uh, itself in the turn of 1990s. Some other scientists defined the Tutsis, Tutsis of Rwanda as an ethnoclass whose mis mission supposedly was to oppress the Hutus as a separate ethnic group and as a social class. Another example, the physical anthropology, which was considered as a scientific anthropology, aimed to prove that uh, races existed and they were hierarchically differentiated. Cesare Lambroso, who was one of the founders of uh, criminal anthropology, emphasized that a criminal was a born criminal, that a prostitute was a born prostitute, and that the social experience played no role in these facts. The geopoliticians have explained that the war has been determined by human conditions, by nature, by history, or by God. All these deadly de de constructions were presented or are still presented as absolute scientific truths, facts, and realities. And in 1940, 1980s, many French and German men and some women of sciences ignored, uh, explained that uh, the French chemistry had strictly nothing to do with German chemistry and the German physics were absolutely unique, had nothing to do with degenerated French physics. It is obvious that no one will pay any attention to such absurdities today, but they were scientific truths of yesterday. And the academia has to show this evolution, has to become a genealogist and make the genealogies of the ideas that are circulating even today. I already insisted on the necessity of plurality within the academia. And we see that also in other examples. Just take the case of Marxism. Marxism as a, method a methodology, as a means of questioning societies, as a means of theory building and conceptualization still has an enormous potentiality. But Marxism, when it is an ossified system of thought, as it was the case in the former Soviet Union, or as an ideology transformed into justification of war, could but destroy the hermeneutics and the, this potentiality of creating, criticizing the society, creating a methodology, questioning the societies, proposing new conceptualizations. <coughs> or even Islamic and Christian thinkings, philosophies, could become very fructuous in some periods, particularly when they were hermetic, and could contain a lot of resources, but transformed into a system of legitimization of a theocracy, as in Iran, or into inquisition, uh, they became sterile, totally sterile fields. The extra academic functions of the academia also means a new vision of relations that we can establish with the past ones. When you see, for instance, the French radical right, the Opus Dei, the discourse of Putin, but you can add also Ahmadinejad, Khamenei, or Erdogan, you are immediately struck by the fact that they erect fidelity to the deaths. For them, the only reasons of the, or the raison d'etre, or the only reasons for the social living societies is to become loyal to the legacy of the past, the legacy of the deaths, to defend the causes of the death people, and avenging them as the main goal of their, roving, uh, their, their, their own future. Both impose the tutelages tutelage of the dead on the living ones. But the wonderful Heinrich Eine, the French German poet of 19th century, suggested us that we should listen to the past ones. 
and established another link of loyalty with them. Listen to their sorrow, to their broken dreams and hopes, that we have to listen to them because they ask us not to avenge them, but not to make the same mistakes as them and to not commit, commit the same crimes as them. They ask at us not to be the future deaths, but to be, to be bearers of life and not the messengers of Thanatos. Academia plays a decisive role in this dialogue with the deaths. It allows us, for instance, to show how a huge crime such as World War I had been possible, what it was its cost, and to show that this great war did pay, pave the way to totalitarianism and to the Second World War. Not only history as a discipline, but all disciplines of academia has to intervene on this field. For instance, the medicine will say that the sentence of 50 million people died during the Second War has no meaning at all. Because these 50 million were each an individual, had each a history, a life. And social sciences and sciences that are leveled positive show that the land watered by, by blood will not become a homeland, but only a sterile life, land. This dialogue with the deaths means also that academia has to rethink its own relation with its past ones. For instance, Durkheim, Weber, we have to come back constantly to them. We have to continue to learn from them, to reevaluate them, to reinterpret them, but also to question them. How come that Weber was a supporter of Germany during World War I? How come that Durkheim has tried to understand the German behavior during World War I by using references almost to, gen to genetics or gen to, to, to biology? We have to learn from them, but also to go beyond them in order to shed a new light to the dead angles that they were not able to lighten. The world of today is different from the world of 1920s, 1930s, but there are many similarities, many similarities concerning both the Agora and the Academia. Hannah Arendt reminded us that the Academia could but see the light in a world where Agora was possible. Academia does not play a direct role in the Agora, but thanks to its autonomy, thanks to its existence as an institution, it allows us to think, to rethink the past, the present, and the future of the Agora. An academia deprived from its liberties and autonomy, autonomy means that Agora itself has ceased to exist, that the liberties allowing it to exist have already been destroyed. In such conditions, academia has no other chance than to resist in order to maintain its existence. Maintaining this existence, even if it is deprived from institutions that it needs, if necessarily, in extramuros, if necessary, in informal ways, if necessary, by abandoning scientific production at the benefit of other forms of intellectual productions. This resistance means metamorphosis, but also the condition of uh, bringing together the condition of the future for, for rebirth. That's why an academia hit in its lifeblood blood, is not an academia waiting for its burial, but it is an academia in which grow the grows the future life in extremely constrained conditions. Thank you so much. Gelex Fass. <laughs>